everyone, and welcome to another edition of Taking Stock Live, where we do just that. We take stock with what's going on, really, with retailers and brands at the intersection of those worlds with technology all over the world. And I know for me personally, this guest today is someone who helps me take stock of really understanding where is the mind, the mantra, the soul of the consumer around the world. Today's guest is John Dick. Uh, John, if you're not, if those of you who are not already subscribed to John's Saturday email, it's probably the only reason I checked my, my inbox on Saturdays. His what we're seeing email really gives you just a sense of, of wh where the world is and um, abstracting away really all the corporate speak and understanding consumer sentiment. John is the founder of Civic Science, which is a consumer intelligence company. I'll let him tell you a little bit more about what that means. John, welcome. Thanks for being here. Well, Shelly, it's so great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's wonderful to have you. And I always start off by asking, because this is a very retail and brand specific audience, I start off by asking guests, what was their first job in retail? But I don't know if you actually, did you ever work in retail? or, or And if, if you didn't, what was your first job? Believe it or not, my first job was in retail. It was actually, oh, okay. I, and, and and the only time I ever worked in retail. But um, in my hometown, there was a family-owned um, haberdashery, as it were, men's suits, and evolved into more of that. But um, family-owned. My dad actually worked there when he was a kid. They would bring in um, a high school sophomore who would work for three years through their three years of school. One of the things that they they did a big tuxedo rental business for the prom season, so they were. <laughs> Sort of that was part of the gimmick, but my dad had worked there 35 years before I did. Long the company just the the business just um, had its hundredth anniversary, so the business is still going. I started as sort of like a stock, you know, folding ties and folding shirts, and um, over you know over the next year or two, learned that I could was a pretty decent salesperson, which actually kind of manifested itself later in my career, and um, started doing some 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 sales. I mean, it was smaller, you know, there was a tailor there, and people would come in and sort of get fitted for their suits and stuff on 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 site. But yeah, my first job was actually in retail last time. Wow. Yeah. I love that, and I I was worried when you were saying that you were going to say, but the store doesn't exist anymore. But to hear you say that it's is that was that in Pittsburgh? Yeah. Or is that where you grew? Yeah. Okay. Burke, wow. Burke's, Burke's Men's Store. I think it's on its fourth, maybe fifth generation now. Family ownership. It's awesome. awesome. Wow. Okay. Right. Good. Yeah. So from from helping people get fitted for tuxes during prom season to starting civic science, and there's obviously a lot in between that. But you know, tell us first, tell us what is civic science and how what inspired you to start it. Yeah, so we're a consumer research company. We've figured out a really clever way to do massive, massive amounts of survey research, millions of times a day. Um, really kind of, I won't get in too much in the weeds on it, but we figured out a way to sort of disrupt the economics of the way the survey industry is run and allows us to just do you know, huge amounts of, of survey data collection every day from this really like real group of people. It's not kind of the paid survey panelists that tend to comprise most survey research today. And we made a decision a few years ago that, what we wanted, we wanted to be more in the, like what we would call like the syndicated research business, meaning rather than somebody paying us to go collect survey data for them because we'd sort of disrupted these economics, we said, wouldn't it be cool if we just asked everything we could possibly think of? Um, so now there's almost 400,000 questions in our database of things that we ask, which is an, like an astonishing number, um, and then ask things that we believe to be either commercially useful or culturally useful and sell intelligence against that rather than selling the ability to, to parlay a survey from one person to another. Uh, and so we got that business to um, a really impressive scale about three or four years ago. And now we study, we, we say um, everything affects everything and everything's constantly changing. So we study everything constantly. So the really, the really fun stuff that we do is surveying people about literally anything you can possibly imagine. But a lot of it is their retail behaviors and their brand preferences and their health and wellness and so on. And the really exciting stuff we do is that we study not only the time trend of those things, but also how they all relate to one another. So we can kind of cross tabulate all of that data and see that there's remarkable correlations between say somebody's health and wellness behavior and maybe what their preferred apparel brand might be. Uh, and we we sell um, products and services against that data to lots of big brands, lots of retailers, media companies and hedge funds on Wall Street. And it's a really fun business, it's cool. Things are changing at a pace that I could have never expected. And when I read your work, 
somehow it gives it makes me understand better how people should make investment decisions, even in things like technology. And so particularly right now, where there's so much uncertainty and as retailers are going into their biggest shopping season, um, I was very interested in what you wrote this weekend. You're you're actually, I think, seeing increases in people's desire to shop Black Friday, the doorbusters, are, are the pajamas and the doorbusters back? participating in Cyber Monday. So talk a little bit about how things have changed in the retail market and what you're seeing for what we might see in the upcoming uh, months or six weeks. Well, I'll come back to where it changed and okay. that's a much longer story. I, we, we are still relatively on the bullish end of the spectrum for the holiday retail season. We we tend to be a little bit more aligned with like what the NRF's projections are. We think um, dollars should be up four to six percent um uh units might be down because people are just paying for goods um but the consumer's just showing a, a tremendous level of resiliency um you know a lot of it is now yes we're seeing credit card expenditures rise so people are mortgaging a bit to 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 maintain their holiday shopping goals um but for the retailers that's still a good thing um you know we we had this circumstance where a large sector of the U.S. economy stockpiled a ton of cash for almost two years, right? Um, notwithstanding the the third um, of the economy that was really, really hard hit by the pandemic. But if you kept your job and your income through the first year and a half or two of the, since COVID came along, you you put a lot of money away, right? All the area, the categories we couldn't spend in and the extra money that people got from the government. And we're still seeing the sort of exhausts of that being spent down through through the holidays. I mean, if this Christmas was coming next summer, I would feel I might not be quite as positive, but I still think there's a lot of pent up household income that we're going to see show up. Um, we also think, you know, Black Friday will do um, surprisingly well because people um, want to get back into that store experience. Um, maybe the the least intuitive trend we're seeing in our data is the percentage of younger consumers who want to go shop Black Friday. They want to go out to the stores, right? They've been cooped up for too long, and this is like going to be a really cool experience for them to kind of, you know, get that sort of full Black Friday um, treatment. So, no, we we think, look, you know, it's it's the the holiday season's been spread out now so far. It's hard to know those people that were shopping for retail and. July and June, how much is that going to eat away at what would have, they would have spent on Black Friday? We don't have enough years of history to make those comparatives yet, but I think net-net, it's going to be a good holiday retail season. It's great to hear, and I think so far, even just what we're seeing in terms of the results that have come out from earnings and whatnot, we started to see some of that, right, where um, the consumer is still there. They're, and as you said, um, dollars look great. I think most Retailers are now saying they have to look at units. Um, it was a, some combination of your data and the NPD data, which showed us that the two categories on units that are growing are prestige cosmetics and auto parts, which I thought, I was like, <laughs> that, that's an interesting, like, sort of um, household spend, uh, trade that trade balance there. But as you said, it does look like um, the consumer is going to hold up um, this season, um, though underneath it, some of the behaviors of you know, ages and demographics have changed. Sure. Who do you think in terms of, as you think about winners and losers, how are you starting to, to, to see the shakeout there in terms of the retailers? Again, a very multifaceted question. Um, two, two things that sort of evolved out of kind of kind of coming out of COVID. One of them started a lot in COVID, which is we, we've watched technology adoption among older populations of Americans accelerate dramatically because of those early days of COVID when people were the most at risk and stuck at home and had to learn how to use different digital tools. And then and then now what we're seeing as, as sort of quarantine lifted and younger people want to sort of get out of the house again, we're now watching more in-store behavior. Now, look, it's still not comparable. The younger people are still more digital and vice versa, but it's sort of meeting and we're meet, reaching this sort of level of equilibrium there. So I think first and foremost, uh, retailers who are set up for a really, really strong sort of multi-channel, cross-channel um, proposition, super, super important. And then understanding what those two different consumers uh, want. The in-store shopper, while yes, maybe on Black Friday, they're chasing deals, they want the in-store experience. They want the social element of it. They want to be able to touch and feel things, right? The digital person um, wants ease, right? Simplicity. Uh, look, the, the the internet is a deflationary tool, right? Our ability to shop for price on the internet has given a lot of power to the consumer. And so the retailers that are able to meet 
the consumer who wants um, a value experience online, but wants a more of a physical kind of actual experience in the store, those are the ones that are going to work is the ones that and the, and the ones that can achieve the balance of that. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that this is like kind of hot off the press a bit, but we've actually seen the outcome of the election um, the recent midterm election actually had a positive impact on spending intent among consumers because I think there was this perception of, oh, my gosh, what could happen? Were we going to have some crisis in the country? And and look, I can also tell you that one side of the political aisle responded more favorably favorably to those outcomes than the other. But that group of people is saying, yeah, I'm actually maybe a little more likely to spend now than I was before um, because I was nervous about what the future was going to be. And, and without getting into specific brands, it might appeal to one side of the political aisle or the other. Just simply understanding that the, the impact that that the political environment has on the psychology and the mental wellness of people and how that flows into where and how they shop and what they're looking to buy. Those things are really that's sort of a new frontier for retailers. That I don't think they thought about, year, you know, two years ago, three years ago. Yeah, I mean, I, I and this is not as so it's so fun to get the sort of hot off the press. But I remember looking at some work you had done of just sort of uh, brands that that. Uh, consumers gravitated to depending on where they were on sort of either either side of the political aisle and also that indication of sort of positive or negative in terms of where um, they were going to spend their money. Are you, are you seeing that um, continue to play out in terms of political party affecting a lot of where people are shopping and, and their um, how they're feeling about the economy? Yeah, yeah, big time. I mean, part of it is because we we tend to align with media or brands that align with our values or what have you. But the other part of it is we've self-selected so much as consumers, particularly in our social networks, with people who are like-minded. And we read media and news sites or what have you that sort of speak to our existing values. And so there's like this echo chamber that's almost created by that. So the recommendations that I hear from my friends about where to shop or a movie to watch um, they don't, they're not necessarily political in the nature that they're recommended, but because I've sort of surrounded myself with like-minded people, um, we tend to gravitate towards brands in almost a herd sort of way. And I don't mean to diminish that actually in any way, shape, or form. It's just the way that it is. It's been a, there, there, are, there are a lot of topics that we study today where political psychographics are even more important than understanding someone's actual demographics. Like it might be more important to understand their political points of view than maybe their gender or their education or their income level. It's it's just been a remarkable trend. We've watched it started happening about eight years ago and it's just getting more and more and more. It's wild. I mean, it's crazy as you think about like, you know, somebody who buys a Toyota or somebody who goes to Chipotle. I mean, and you're saying that those decisions are somewhat, you're, where they're gravitated to depending on what political party someone's in? A bit, yeah. I mean, some sometimes it's more conscious than others, right? Mm -hmm. Like I may choose to eat at Chipotle versus Chick-fil-A, say, for one reason or another. And that's maybe a bit more of a of me choosing to say vote with my wallet. Mm -hmm. But a lot a lot a lot more of it is 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 subconscious or unconscious. It's because of the 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 tribe of people with whom I tend to spend most of my time is also where I learn about new things and hear about new stores and new restaurants and new TV shows and movies, right? So that's a little bit less um, again, uh, conscious, I'd say, by the consumer, but it has an absolute real impact. Hmm. What surprises do you think we're going to have on the horizon as we think about this this up upcoming season? Um, well, I think you mentioned prestige beauty. I think all of beauty is going to do pretty well. I think beauty beauty is one of my it, – it's a, a category that I probably knew the least about um, <laughs> for lots of reasons. But um, – I've learned a lot about it in the last several months. And one of the things that's fascinating to me that makes me very bullish on the beauty category is what the really strong beauty retailers have done a great job of doing is positioning beauty as a wellness product, right? And and that allows the category to ebb and flow with with sociocultural norms and trends in our country, right? If, if we happen to, and some of this is like generational where, you know, beauty is more about, um, almost a vanity, maybe more about vanity in some ways, or I'm going to be out. I want to look, I want to look like a, you know, a celebrity or whatever, or we're in a, in a phase right now, particularly with Gen Z, that's a lot more like Gen X, 
where it's it's more about being understated a lot or being um, being certainly much more about authenticity. Where you know beauty has done a remarkable job, and I think of brands like Ulta Beauty is the one that comes to mind. That if you look at their marketing, what a tremendous job they've done of sort of orienting the category as a wellness. Um, purchase and wellness investment for the consumer. Um, and so I, I think we're going to see a lot of resiliency from 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 the beauty category, even through, you know, not just through the holidays, but into next year, regardless of how, you know, maybe dire the economic, uh, the macroeconomic environment is. So that's a big one. Um, still a lot of experience spending. Um, people still haven't ticked off those bucket list things they didn't get to do during COVID. So we'll still see quite a bit of that. Um, now, First quarter of next year, probably see a bit more softening in, say, restaurant. But um, but again, we're just watching this resiliency of the consumer that I think is continuing to surprise Wall Street. It actually gives me so much heart to both hear the resilience of the consumer. But as you said, um, beauty becoming more than just sort of the vanity purchases, but actually a reflection of diversity and inclusion as well as the wellness category. I was just at a a conference last week, I got to hear uh, Greg Renfrew, who started Beauty Counter, speak. And she was sort of just like it was, you know, she kind of made us all like I made me want to shrink under my chair because she said, you know, you guys have probably all gotten up and, you know, gone for a run and then had your green juice. And then you put whatever like lotions and or for the men, whoever you've shaved, you probably put formaldehyde all over your body. <laughs> you know, so and it was it was it was, we, the whole room just kind of because it's true. Um, you know, there are these things that are so incredibly personal, yet we're actually not in, um, looking at them through the same lens as, as so many other pieces of our lives. As we as we look at sort of turning into the to the new year, you mentioned that you think, you know, by the summer, the consumer might look kind of different. Say more about how you think things might change as as we take a longer time horizon on um, the spirit of the consumer. If we're looking past the holiday retail season, certainly yeah. there's uh, there's a lot of unknowns. But there 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 are things. First of all, this consumer resiliency can only go so far unless certain macroeconomic circumstances change. If inflation um, starts to fall, which we tend to believe it's going to fall faster than most people think. That could that could change what I'm about to say. Um, but otherwise, you know, seeing the fact that consumers are dipping into their credit cards a bit more aggressively right now to get through holiday, um, there's going to be a reckoning. Obviously, when those credit card bills show up in January, and um, you know, we we've got continued high sort of energy prices, so people are paying a lot to heat their homes in the winter. We're probably going to see the consumer retract a good bit in the second half of the first quarter of next year. And then what the economy looks like going forward, you know, your guess is as good as mine, depending on sort of what kind of recessionary climate we're headed to or not. But we're, you're going to see the you're going to see the customer continuing to look for value, looking for deals. We're not going to see the same massive uh, experience spending next summer that we saw this past summer. It's just impossible. I mean, most people, those European vacations that they canceled in 2020 or 2021, they all happened. We're just the, the comps on sort of experience spending next summer are going to be much smaller, which should do better for like the general merchandise categories, we would think. Um, things that have changed about the consumer that we think are permanent is our desire to be outside. So continued categories like you know, camping, um, hiking, um, pickleball is like, that's like all the rage, right? That's that's here to stay. That's sort of outside reconnecting with my family and my friends in an outdoor environment, like that's here. So that's going to stay through next summer. Um, but, you know, hopefully by then we've, we've, the inflation is cooled and yes, maybe the consumers aren't sitting as much on as much stockpiled savings, but maybe their, you know, monthly, monthly uh, take home isn't getting eaten away as, as badly at the grocery store as it is now. Right. One of the things that you and I have talked about is the really the pivotal role that you and the civic science team play in advising the CMO and sort of um, at Microsoft, we, we speak often to the CIO, but yet the decision making that happens at, with the CMO and the CIO together is so incredibly powerful. How are you seeing sort of if we think about those two 
personas in the companies that you're working with? Are they coming closer together? Are you seeing more alignment there? And how are you advising um, the CMO as, as she or he is navigating this climate? Well, we're advising for as much of that connectivity as possible. Um, yeah. It's a very broad spectrum of of companies out there that are further along in that partnership than others. Some, they probably don't even know each other's names and some of them, they're already working very closely with each other. There's a misnomer, I think, about marketing that um, if you, the, the CIO, CTO, and maybe even the CFO, who view marketing as this sort of like cost center and, you know, um, they see the big commercials and the Super Bowl spends and those kinds of things. But, but, but marketers today, they've got to be obsessed with outcome, right? And and is my are my campaigns performing? Are they driving sales? Right, because the the, the marketing, particularly, is more and more marketing is performance based. Um, the the idea that I'm just going to throw up a big commercial and everyone's going to be happy to see their name on the Super Bowl ad isn't doesn't cut it any longer. And the best way for the CMO to kind of maximize those results, optimize for those results is technology, period, end of story. And and the the intersection between marketing strategy, um, marketing creative, and really strong technical infrastructure, that's the answer. And the companies, right. that, the companies that can do that well are going to win. The, two, the companies that sort of treat those as siloed operations within a business, they're not going to win, just plain and simple. And so um, partnership between the CIO and CMO is, it has to be the future frontier of not just marketing, but also technology, because on the other side of it is the CIO. Um, this is, you know, again, this new frontier. Um, more and more of like the, the technical decisions about which platform, say, to use for marketing is being driven by the CMO. It's not just does it work and is it secure? Yes, those are all table stakes at this point. But do the technologies that we procure for our company, do they en enable the most effective performant marketing possible? Right. So it's kind of in their respective best interests to be partners with each other. And yes, as you know, some companies are a little further along with that than others, but the the ones that are laggards are going to are going to fall behind for sure. Super well said and I I I would just echo what you said in terms of just the amount of money that the CMO is going to spend on things which we never imagined like technical infrastructure and vice versa the CIO needing to understand performance marketing and ROAS and sort of the 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 newer metrics that the CMO is driving. Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, I mean our, our motto at Civic Science, everything affects everything and everything's constantly changing. That's true in this scenario. I mean, the, the marketing dollars are affecting technology. Technology is affecting the marketing dollars. They're all, and, and you've got supply chain affecting this, affecting price, affecting which ads to run, right? I mean, and where to run them. All those things are so intertwined and, 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 and companies have to break the silos they've created across those different parts of the company. And the only two people that can ultimately do that are the CIO and the CMO talking to each other. Because otherwise, you've just got these little fiefdoms and little buckets of company that don't understand that the, the things that they do impact all the other parts of the business. And, and so without warehousing all of that in, in, in one place and being able to have a bird's eye view of the entire relationship between all those assets in a company, you're just going to get left behind by the companies that figure it out faster. Completely. Okay, so John, now I'm going to take a page out of your book, which is uh, asking questions. And um, I'm going to end, end this season three of uh, Taking Stock Live. I've been doing these uh, fa fantastic five, if you will, or fun five. So first question is, what's the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? I ate brains once in a, in a mm -hmm in a restaurant in um, Brussels and it was worse than I imagined it would be. I couldn't get past the, f I tried so hard to. Tastes like chicken, no? Oh, no, no, it was, it was terrible, terrible. There's nothing, the texture, the taste, it was gross. Um, so I wish I could say I'm more cosmopolitan than I am, but no, that was the weirdest no. thing. And yep, yep, never again. I mean, proud of you for trying. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, like tongue was a was a it was a reach for me, but brain that just goes that goes to a place I can't. I don't think I can get behind. Yep, yep, yep. Huge regret. Favorite superhero? Iron Man. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hard to argue. Yeah. I yeah. Just I don't know. The whole thing's pretty cool. Dude can fly around, um, and he's a technologist and just cool. Yeah. I see. I, all, I see. I see some of it in you. Best invention ever. Uh, GPS. 
Mm. I mean, my I am so directionally challenged that the ability to find my way to places now that I don't even have now. Now the problem is, is I couldn't truly find my way to places I've been to a hundred times because I've just put it in my phone and retained zero about how I got there. Um, but GPS is just, I mean, look, we're, we're putting aside like fire and electricity. Right. But if I were to say like recent, for you, yeah, for you, yeah. Recent vintage. Yeah. I don't know where I'd be without GPS. I, I'm with you. Like I, I like to go, to go between my house and my parents' house, a drive I've done, you know, thousands of times. I use GPS now. I don't even know why. <laughs> okay, fly on the wall. If you could listen in on anyone, what, what, where would you be? I pick a band. Um, uh, I don't know. Pearl Jam being maybe my favorite mm. living band or something. I, I would love to be a fly on the wall in a room where they're writing and creating a song from scratch. I mean, watching to see that sort of creative exercise from beginning to end, um, because I will only ever see the finished product. And I've I've been in studios to watch songs performed, but to be a fly on the wall in a room when when a world class, like epic, legendary band is creating the song that becomes sort of the song that plays on the radio for 50 years, I'd love to be a fly on the wall once for that. Dream job. What would it be and why? This is such a cop out, but I have it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I look again, maybe, you know, true G, dream, dream job. Yeah. Fronting a stadium filling rock band sounds like a really cool job, but that's a tough life, right? To have to live and, and to maintain any sort of semblance of a life. Um, um, I've always wanted to be a writer, like a full time writer, but that's also a grind. I just love my job. I mean, I created my job. So, I mean, shame on me if I don't like it. And yeah, of course, there are cer- certain days where I have to deal with problems and things that I wish I didn't. But um, the, the the company we've built has a tremendous social and cultural purpose, right? It isn't just about making money or making money for other people. Um, we have a we have a mission to give you know the world a voice in the decisions that these huge companies and media and other people are making, and and we're achieving that. And and um, I get to work with like incredibly passionate people that believe in that social and cultural purpose. And you know every day is different, and we're growing, so it's you know it's exciting time to be a part of it. So yeah, I think I'm I I mean. I think I have my dream job. Well, you are, and I'm not saying this because I get to curate who comes on this podcast. <laughs> you, It's clear your passion comes through for your dream job. I mean, we are at Microsoft so incredibly grateful to get smarter because of civic science and your leadership. Someone once said to me, for every presentation you do, don't just read the news, but interpret the news. Right. And, and that's what you do. You make each of us smarter about really understanding sort of the zeitgeist of our of our world. And I can't imagine um, somebody who I would trust more to do that. Um, and in the sort of information economy that we're in, we're just so incredibly grateful to be your partner and to be part of what you you're bu- you've built and are building. We love working with with Microsoft and Thank you for all those kind words. It's nice. To oh, meet. it's true. It's genuine and um, huge. Thank you to you. I can't wait to sort of have you back, John, and we'll look at uh, what happened during the holiday season. We're going to look at the middle of next year. Um, your predictions, um, because they're ground in in real data and science, um, often turn out to be true. But it's also fun to look back and see how right we are and what we what we all got wrong. And that's what makes it fun and interesting. Well, g- given that I'm pr- pretty much on the pretty optimistic end of the spectrum. I really hope I'm right. Not just so that I don't have to admit I was wrong, but because I I, I want to be right about a positive view of the future, which... Well, I heard I had the opportunity at the same conference where I felt terrible about those things I'd put on my body to hear the head economist for JP Morgan speak. And in very different way, she said um, a lot of it is the same of what you've shared. So you're on to something. Let's hope. Let's hope. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today. And I uh, really, really appreciate it. Take care. So for all of you out there who have tuned in to another edition of Taking Stock Live, I know you will have really appreciated the, this conversation. You'll probably have as many questions as you do have answers. And so please share them with us. We love to see what you're thinking, what's on your mind, and what you want to hear more of. And mostly, I want to say a huge thank you for tuning in and watching this edition of Taking Stock Live. Thank you.